a very good warm welcome from Talking Industry. Uh, my name is Andy Pai. I'm consultant editor at DFA Media Group. And it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, two excellent speakers. Um, we'll be talking on the subject of IIoT, digitalization, industrial communications, with a special focus on, on network connectivity. Um, my two um, guests today are John Browett, who is general manager of the CC Link Partner Association Europe and also David Bradley Folly, who is the general manager, UK and Ireland of HMS Networks. And I think also director, John, if I've perhaps not quite got your title correct, but no doubt you'll put that right in a while. Both of them have extensive experience in this, in this area and they know each other very well also. So I'm sure we're gonna have an excellent dialogue. Um, in terms of logistics for, um, for our uh, attendees this morning. Um, we want to encourage you to get as involved as you can in terms of communicating with us. And the place to start is the chat function. Um, I'm sure that most of us know um, how Zoom works very well, but if not, you can find the chat function at the bottom of your screen. If it's hidden, it'll be under the three little dots, and then you can access the chat and put any comments and questions into there. If it's a question, please prefix it with a Q colon, that helps. And if you are really keen and would like to speak in person to our uh, presenters, if you put a V colon, that means you may be seen and heard as well, which, uh, which can be great fun. So if anyone feels brave and wants to do that with a particular question and get our dialogue moving, then, then that's fantastic. Um, so as a skeleton of what we're going to do today, um, David will start by providing us with a general overview of networking in general, why it's important in extracting smart data from, uh, from manufacturing, processing plants and the like, and looking a little bit at the business case for smart data. We'll then involve John and we'll have an open discussion about any aspects that come from that, including any questions that we get. Uh, we'll then move to John, who will explain what CC Link is and how it fits in. And we'll also talk a bit about um, the subject of time sensitive networks. And then we'll have another open discussion. And we'll finish by talking together on developments and trends in networking. Um, what about moving to 5G and even 6G and what effects that might have on legacy systems such as um, 2G and 3G based systems and um, what's going to happen to those. Um, there's a beautiful word that David used called sundowning. Um, so, uh, so we'll find a bit about that. We'd like to talk about the growth in wireless networking, what the advantages and limitations of those are. And finally, some of the uh, risks and mediations of cybersecurity um, um, aspects um, because you know, very often manufacturing and processing plant can be the way into a business. So we'll be talking about the risks there. Um, so that's our plan for today. The whole thing should take between an hour, 75 minutes. And um, the more um, interactive our um, attendees are, and we hope you will be, then um, the nearer we'll be to 75 and not 60. So please uh, ask your questions. Um, uh, give us your comments and thoughts, and uh, we'll open we'll open it up that way. So, um, with no more ado, I will pass over to David, who will just introduce himself in a little bit more detail than what I've done, and then he'll talk about networking issues. Over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, thank you for inviting me here today. Yeah, my name's uh, David Bradley Folly. I'm the uh, managing director of uh, HMS UK Limited. That's uh, the UK and Ireland. Um, for those of you who don't know HMS, uh, we're not the Navy. Uh, we're nothing to do with uh, Her Majesty's ships. Um, HMS is a global manufacturer of connectivity and IoT products. Uh, our brands include uh, brands such as E1, Anybus, Exat, and Intersys. And we have more cloud systems than you can shake a stick at. So 
we're like a, a sweet shop. Um, so we help uh, of connectivity products. So we basically help people who are using, say, a Rockwell product and they need to interface to, say, a Siemens product or, um, um, or any other third party device manufacturer. So that's uh, that's about me. Uh, <clears throat> John, did you want to introduce yourself before I talk about uh, sure. network? Yeah, thanks, David. So, yeah, um, my name is John Browett. I'm the uh, general manager of the CC Link Partner Association in Europe. And what the CC Link Partner Association is, we are the organization that is tasked with the development and promotion of the CC Link open network family. Um, so um, we have an industrial Ethernet technology that's open for anybody to use to um, connect devices together in a factory or machine. And uh, the technology that we um, most recently introduced was uh, CC Link IETSN, which is the um, so far the only open industrial Ethernet which combines gigabit bandwidth and time sensitive networking. And as uh, Andy said at the beginning, um, we'll get a bit more into what time sensitive networking is later on uh, for those people today who um, haven't uh, come across that yet. Thanks. Yeah, well, one of the topics uh, Andy's asked me to look at is basically, you know, why we want to use networks and smart data. Um, this really comes down to, um, you know, there is a big revolution. I'm sure we've all read about it. You know, the IoT uh, 4.0, all these little buzzwords that are, uh, are, are flying around the industry. Really, what it comes down to is the devices are becoming a little bit smarter. They've got a lot more diagnostics inside them. You know, even a typical sensor um, has a lot of data, which in the old days you would never have. In the old days, it would just be it's on, it's off. And that was it. But now um, the sensors, even the smallest proximity switch allows you to take this data out. But you've got to have some sort of networking connectivity to get it to where you want it. And this is where kind of smart data and networks coming to their own. Now, whether that's a, a cabled network uh, or whether it's a wireless network, it actually doesn't matter. But it's taking that low level data up into a medium level data. So you've got things in the medium levels like PLCs and HMIs and frequency inverters up to a higher level. You know, that would be where you've got your SCADA, your enterprise systems and stuff like this. And uh, someone once told me that uh, data is the new oil, uh, which probably is gonna make Greta Thunberg uh, very happy. Um, but, um, you know, the reason that companies should look at using more data in the systems, A, because it's there, and B, if they don't, then their competitors will be. So if you want to have competitive advantage, if you want to have higher availability of your systems, if you want to know what's actually going on, you want to know the energy consumption, you want to know all this, what we would call smart data, then networking and, uh, and data gathering and taking that to a useful point where you can interpret that, uh, that data into proper information. This really is um, the way forward for any company. Um, and also you're being backed up by things like legislation now. So if you've got things like uh, the um, ESOS uh, directive, which is an energy monitoring directive, so uh, which was originally when we were in Europe, um, or part of the European Union, shall I say, I think we're still technically in Europe. Um, so they was a, a directive about energy saving. And the, uh, the British government, uh, as well as all the European Union countries, are still obliged to follow that directive, which means that any company over 50 million euros, and that doesn't matter whether that's a library, a school, uh, a manufacturing company, has to have an energy monitoring plan. And of course, energy monitoring plans means getting data. So if you're thinking of an industrial company, frequency inverters use a lot of energy. Uh, motion controllers, linear motors all use energy. And so we have an obligation, a legal obligation actually, to gather that data. So this is why uh, networks are very important. Gathering the data is very important. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass over to you, John, to talk about what type of networks there are. Okay, thanks then. So thanks, David. So um, yeah, well, um, you can kind of like take a historical view of this if you like. So, um, you know, going back 20 years or so, um, maybe a little bit further, there wasn't a lot of networks used in industry in general. Um, you know, in, in those days, um, you typically found that things were all hardwired. 
and there was a lot of wiring everywhere connecting things point to point which you know obviously that had a lot of disadvantages um you um you had to do a lot of wiring work it was wasn't easy to troubleshoot it if you wanted to change something you had to rewire everything and, and so on and and so people started to realize well this is not really a good way to proceed so uh, sometime around that time um the first field buses started to be introduced and and they were a great step forward because they were the things which allowed you to therefore connect all your different devices together using a single cable so you got uh better performance more flexibility even diagnostics and so on started to appear then um but the, the problem you had though at that stage was that um there was many different field buses at that time so there was like cc link um Back in 2000, when it was first introduced, it was Profinet, sorry, Profibus, I should say, um, DeviceNet and so on. And um, and they couldn't talk to each other. And um, although um, there were some efforts made to standardize all that, it didn't really achieve so much. And um, so a few years later on, you started to see Ethernet creep onto the factory floor. And, and the benefit of Ethernet was that um, it... Um, at least provided you with a standardized physical layer, as you could say, you know, the cabling and so on was all the same for everybody. Whereas with the field buses, it was often different between different technologies. And, uh, but then of course the problem with ethernet was that um, it wasn't really meant for a deterministic use, you could say, i.e. That, that means that you can never tell for sure when something was going to happen, um, which, you know, if you're in an office sending emails, if it arrives one minute or the next minute, it doesn't really matter. But if you're running a high-speed packaging machine and everything's very tightly synchronized in terms of motion control, things even get a tiny amount of time, like milliseconds, uh, unsynchronized with each other, then you're going to have problems. Um, so, so I guess the next step was was the various industrial Ethernet protocols started to appear, and, and when we introduced CC-Link IE, and um, there's various other ones like Profinet and so on, and um, and so that that addressed that situation. Uh, and then so basically now we're in a situation where I think industrial Ethernet has become accepted as being the way that we connect things together. And um, these various protocols have all found favor with various industries in various parts of the world. But now we're kind of moving into the future where um, we're taking it one step further. So, so as I was mentioning at the beginning, two of the key points that are enabling that are... Um, gigabit bandwidth is becoming a real topic these days um you know in the past people used to think that 100 megabit bandwidth was fine but as david was saying earlier um now we're getting this kind of like you could say a, a metaphorical explosion of data on the factory floor um you, you need a lot more bandwidth to be able to deal with it all and um and going along with that is is time sensitive networking which uh, as, as we'll dig into maybe in a little while um tsn as everybody refers to it as um is is offering more benefits on top of that because now you have the ability to combine multiple types of network traffic together whereas in the past you know for example on a machine you might have had a safety network a motion network network io maybe some it stuff going on as well the cameras or something and they were all typically running separate networks, whereas now with TSN, you can combine all that together onto a single network. So therefore, your, your machinery gets simpler, your design is simpler, your cost can be reduced and, and so on. So, so you know, that, that's where we are and, and that's where we're heading into the future. And, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're proud to have companies like HMS as, as some of our partner companies because um, they're giving our technology some really good support from the development point of view so that the other vendors in the market uh, can start building this technology into their products. And, uh, you know, hopefully now we can all move into the future and, and make things better for everybody. I think, you know, there's, as you mentioned, John, the kind of Ethernet networks are, are coming into their own, but, um, you know, there's still a lot of the old serial networks still out there, you know. Um, yep. And I think now we're coming into like this kind of economic sort of, you um, position in the uk where everyone's worried about uh the the financial future going on we don't know if we're going to go into a recession so companies are actually keeping their existing networks and trying to get more life out of them so even the old serial networks which you mentioned you know like cc link profibus 
um, you know, device net. They're trying to squeeze the last slight remnants of juice right. or it's data true. they can yeah. get out of it because, you know, they don't want to go to that overall change to Ethernet. But as you said, that that step change from going from traditional sort of serial networks to Ethernet, it, it kind of brings you into a whole different sort of ball game because, as you said, you've got more bandwidth, you've got diagnostic tools because you can start to use, you know, IT tools uh, to help with diagnostics. Um, and also, as you said, the data traffic uh, and all this configuration, its it kind of opens up new doorways and you've got things where you can actually start selling your data. You know, you've got your PaaS systems, your SaaS systems, all these things. And I think it's it's an exciting time to move over. But, you know, there are still a lot of companies um, installing old, what you would probably deem as an old fashioned network because they they don't want to make that change yet, but they can still maximize that that data. I think yeah, that's yeah, what's kind of important, true. you know. And you obviously with CC Link, you've got this upgrade path, so it's um it's very important for um, for end users and systems integrators as well, because yeah, yeah, you know, going into an Ethernet network, you need more IT skills to a degree. Yeah, for diagnostics. Well, yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, you know. Um industrial automation in general in terms of sort of like the speed at which it progresses it's it's a bit of a paradox in a way because you know apple or whoever it is they introduce the next iphone like every six months or whatever it is and um and you know the the, the rate of change in consumer electronics and those kind of industries is extremely fast but yeah you know when you are building a production line for a factory and it's got to last maybe 10 15 years or more because it costs millions of pounds, euros, dollars, or whatever. Um, you know, obviously the pace of change tends to be a lot slower because that's a huge investment and it's got to pay for itself over a long time period. So as a result, you, you know, Dave is absolutely right. You do see people out there that are still using what you might term legacy technologies still. And um, but yeah, it, I, you know, in the end, it will move uh, faster in the future. I think, and I think you know the fact that technologies like ethernet and other it technologies which are creeping into manufacturing now um is helping to drive that i mean you know um andy was saying at the beginning about cybersecurity, and um there's been good points and bad points about these technologies arriving you know obviously they've they've delivered a lot of benefits performance diagnostics and all that kind of stuff but at the same time they brought some challenges with them too which um you know like cybersecurity in the past wasn't really a topic for manufacturing everything was kind of bespoke and um the only people who knew what was going on inside a system was the people that designed it and um of course now um that's not the case anymore so things like cyber security become much more of a topic i think that that's kind of the change in the industry i'm a, you know I, I don't know about yourself john but i remember the first plc's they had like a bespoke plc chip and only the manufacturer of the plc knew what the chip did you know and then they right, went on exactly. to exactly Windows C versions of chips where you only put in certain parts of the of the um, the uh, operating system, but now you're using more common components, you know, like ARM processors. Anybody can mm -hmm. go on the internet yeah, and absolutely. get you know data on that processor, which, as you said, gives us more. How can we call it? Better uh, proven technology, and mm -hmm. we can get you know we get a whole load of different um, features which we can add to these uh, products, but. Um, you are opening it up to, uh, let's call it cybersecurity challenges. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, so the more accessible the the technology, the potentially easier it is to to break into it because familiarity is is it's much more general. Published on the internet, it, isn't it? Which Especially, is an interesting yeah. paradox, really. Yeah. yeah but um, yeah. so but how do you get your, around that? Oh, my apologies. Well, just to clarify that, even on, you know, when you're looking at a typical Ethernet network, so, you know, TCP IP, most companies, when they're using a TCP IP network or developing it, they will just use a, a piece of um, shareware or whatever that they bought off the Internet, which is a proven piece of technology. Um, and that's great. You know, it works because it's used in millions of devices. But like all software, there are always... Uh, flaws in it um you know you can't guarantee a piece of software's got no um no mistakes in it you know i think was it 10 mistakes to 25 mistakes in every thousand lines of code is a typical coding error you know typical computers got 50 million lines of code so okay you know you can see how many little bugs can creep in 
what's more worrying is uh, I think a Tesla's got a hundred million lines of code. So um, yeah, <laughs> you know, you don't want the blue screen of death as you're driving down the road. But but you all you can do is is you know use proven technologies, Andy. I think that's that's where companies are going, and the more companies. Um, who are developing these products? I mean, they they you know they do actually offer them up to people like Naviso to do what you call um, you know hacking of a device to see if they can find out any flaws. You know, this is legitimate hacking. And companies, you know, even companies like HMS, we pay companies like Naviso to try and break our products yeah. uh, to find these. Some are, are just pure coding errors. Some are actually design errors. Um, but all companies face that. The more complicated a product is then you know the more code involved and the more likelihood there is some sort of vulnerability but you have to try and patch it you have to do your scenario testing and i think you know this is a challenge for the industry but i think at the moment i mean john you i don't know if you know more about this than me but i think most of it's still on the, the kind of the plc the masters end rather than the actual network but I do know security, you know, we we deal with a lot of customers. We supply um, interface cards to about 85% of the world's frequency inverter manufacturers. And they're looking at having cyber secure versions of those interface cards yeah. because they yeah. see that's where it's going. But I don't know if you're seeing it now, John. Yeah, no, that, that's right, David. I mean, when, when cyber security first started to become an issue on the manufacturing floor, as it were, um, I think one of the first um, attempts to lock everything down, one of the first philosophies, if you if you like, um, was to basically put a big firewall in front of the factory so that, um, you yeah, know, the idea was to try and keep the bad guys out of the factory in general. And then hopefully if they couldn't get through the firewall, then you didn't really need to worry too much about what was behind it. Uh, but uh, there was somebody I read once made some comment about if you build a 10 foot wall, sooner or later, somebody comes along with an 11 foot ladder and um and that's you know that's why now cyber security is like you say it's spreading throughout the plant um it's there's various vendors that, that we work with at clpa some again who are partners of ours and um they now have various devices and other measures that pretty much go right on the product itself so like you said um you know if you've got a big inverter that's maybe running the motor that runs the sawmill um you know you can protect that directly rather than hoping that nobody actually can get into the sawmill and um so yeah that, that's definitely becoming the way that things are going now yeah. i think you know that's something that we've noticed when speaking to a lot of end users in the old days everyone kind of rushed over to this kind of iot purge you know everyone did wanted um you know the um iot products or edge products and stuff like that but now there seems to be a little bit more caution and i think that's because there's been sort of instances where cyber security breaches have happened you know i think saudi aramco was the was the big one which you know was quite um well publicized in the press but again what that was was actually human error rather than actually the technology failing you know it's um again well, i won't get into conspiracy theories this isn't the place for that but the um <laughs> but the um but the technology itself was quite interesting that you know somebody managed to get through uh i think there was schneider uh safety plc's or something i can't think um, but this thing about uh, these kind of uh, publicized stories tends to make end users or, um, you know, more cautious now. So I know when we're speaking to end users, they're, they're saying, OK, you know, we, we kind of distance ourselves from having things like remote access and remote monitoring, uh, unless you can prove that your system is is completely secure. But, you know, I think proving something is is up to the best in class industry thing is, is is very easy but to to guarantee that a piece of software with 100 million lines of code is is completely perfect you know you're, you're never going to have it i think you know the uh, i think fujitsu are going through that uh, the problem at the moment aren't they too, uh, yeah, yeah, indeed, extent. unfortunately yeah yes but you know i think yeah. their, their problems were much bigger because they were aware of the problems it's the it's the things that you don't know um but it's it is interesting that end users are now trying uh, to restrict the amount of direct access to devices on a network. You know, they want to try, as you said, I think, contain it through like a big firewall. And um, But if they do that, then they kind of miss out on the other opportunities they've got. Because if you can use, let's say, uh, you know, CC Link IE and you can go directly to a device on it, then the manufacturer 
of that product. If there's a problem, he can log on to it. He can help with the maintenance, can help with the diagnostics and can do it directly rather than having to go through a PLC, which which is actually designed not to allow you access. So it's, as I said, it, it's an interesting discussion. Um, you know, do you allow people access to your network um, for a connection to to minor devices or do you just keep them, you know, the other side of the master? So. Yeah, well, it's, it's a classic example of a double-edged sword, to use a cliche, isn't it? I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of powerful things you can do by having remote access to, to the plant or whatever it is. But at the same time, you want to make sure that access is only granted to those people who really should have it. So, um, so yeah, you've got to make sure you're taking care of both sides of it. Yeah, you know, it is it is interesting. I mean, I don't know which way I would probably go. Probably I would side on the the, the side of trying to get as much data out of the network as possible. But that's that's my personal belief. Um, but whatever happens, if you don't innovate, if you don't start innovating, then your competitors will. That's that's the bottom yeah, line. Absolutely. You know, whether you're yeah. a food manufacturer, you know, if you're a Kellogg's going against a Dr. Oker, if Dr. Oker's using that type of technology to improve its productivity and speed and cut its costs and reduce its energy, you have to follow suit. Um, so you know, if you don't, you'll be left behind. Um, you know, luckily there's organizations like the CLPO there to advise you on on these things as well. You know, as an open organization. So right, absolutely. Yeah. Potential customers are going to need confidence in the suppliers of the equipment that they're going to use in their network. So how do you provide them with that confidence? I mean, I mean, there's two types of installations which we can talk about as well, whether it's a new installation. Or whether it's an upgrade, which I, you know, be interesting to hear your respective views on, right? Which is the most um, common. Um, yeah. But how do you gain the confidence of a prospective user? Sure. Yeah. Well, you do have yeah. this cyber security issue under control. Yeah. Well, looking at it from a bigger picture part point of view, uh, Andy, um, um, at the CLPA, and I think in common with a lot of the open network associations, um when you know we have um we have what about 400 um partner companies now that actually manufacture products using our technology and so you know when you're building a machine or a line or whatever there's a lot of choice for different devices you can use to use on that line so you know there's io there's plc there's inverters and all the rest of it and um so obviously one of the key points for people who are building a system like that is to make sure if I'm getting a PLC from this guy and I'm getting an inverter from that guy and so on, that they better all talk to each other and work properly. And, um, and the way we guarantee that um, is by um, insisting that they all have to do a conformance test. So, um, so basically they develop the product and obviously, you know, we work with them on that if, if they need support at that level. And um, then when the product's finished, it's submitted to one of our several testing labs that we have around the world. And, um, and it's put through its paces to make sure it complies with all the, our specifications and, and works in the correct way. And then at the end of it, the, uh, the manufacturer gets a certificate that says, yeah, this complies with our technology. And then they know when they sell it to um, a customer, as if they're using products using our technology that have different functions from other vendors um, as long as they've all been certified then they know they should be able to put it together and there won't be any problems um, so so yeah that that's kind of how we handle it from our point of view you'll be actually quite surprised how many companies don't go for the certification because you can buy you know companies like us we make cc link interfaces which can go into a product like a Brinkins inverter and we always encourage companies to to go for the certification it doesn't matter which network and the reason being is then you can guarantee that it will talk to third party devices. Yeah, absolutely. But you'd yeah. be surprised how many um, manufacturers decide not to and they just want to, you know, just fudge it. Um, you know, even some very large companies, um, which has always been surprising to us because it is it's, it's not actually that much to get a certified product properly tested yeah, that's it yeah um, compared yeah. to how much you're going to be sending engineers to site to work well, exactly yeah and, it's not working so. yeah and, and we see that sometimes too um you know you work with a company and they say okay well the product's done now so we're going to start selling it and when we say to them well sorry you know that's not allowed you when you're a partner of ours you have to get it conformance tested and and you would think that yeah if, if you spent the time and effort to actually develop the thing and get it 
ready for market, then, you know, the, the conformance testing is really just like the cherry on the cake at the end. It's, you know, it's kind of almost a formality if you've done it properly. Yeah, I mean, most of the, I think a lot of the networks now are saying that certification is, is kind of mandatory. Um, I, I can't remember if the CLP says, I know um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we sort of coffee net too. is, I think, is it yeah. CC Link? But anyway, yeah. um, but again, it's, it's very hard to enforce it. So what we try and do, you know, because obviously we supply a lot of these, um, you know, network interfaces to, to lots of different manufacturers. So we also try and educate the end users. Well, I think that's something I know um, you've been working on, John, is to try and get end users to say, OK, we will only use certified products because then you're guaranteed yeah. that they have this, you know, operability between devices, no matter which manufacturer makes them. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 we can, yeah, we, we encourage that too. I mean, you know, we've seen like, for example, in the automotive industry, there's there's the large end users in the automotive industry that we're all familiar with. Their products are driving around our streets and neighborhoods all the time. And um and they they you, you they often take that for sort that position too that, you know, okay, well I want to use these products, but if it's not tested and certified, I'm not using it. Cause um, you know, if you're building cars, downtime easily runs into the tens of thousands of euros, pounds, dollars, or whatever it is, um, you know, in a very short period of time. So, you know, they can't take that kind of risk. It has to be working first time. Yeah. That's an, it's an the interesting... The actual conformance process, is that, um, how does that work? Is that subject to particular standards that you test to? Yeah. And yeah. are they changing rapidly over time? How do you keep up to date? Yeah, well, in our case, at least, anyway, I mean, I can't talk to the other guys, of course, but um, in, in our case, we have published test specifications that are available to our partners, uh, the companies that are actually making the products. And so they know exactly what's required and what they have to do. And, and typically what they will often do before they submit a product for testing is that they will do some kind of like initial testing where they, they test sort of like different parts of the product in different ways to make sure it's going in the right direction. And then when they finally finished all that part then they have a final product that they submit for testing and, and you know they they know what the test lab's going to do they know what kind of uh, parameters it needs to uh to match and um and then you know the test lab does all these tests that because they're published they're not a surprise to anybody or well, they shouldn't be and um and then hopefully at the end um everything's fine and they get their certificate and 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 everybody's happy um, and, and certainly in our case, um, you know, the, the tests are quite rigorous. They, they're not, it's not just kind of like, um, you know, making sure it communicates in the right way or whatever. Um, you know, we, we also have noise testing, for example, so that um, you, you have to show that the product will run for a set period of time in, a, in an, artif an artificial noise tested environment where there's a, there's a noise generator that's putting out all kinds of rubbish into the uh, frequency spectrum to make sure that the product can deal with that kind of thing too. So, so yeah, that, that, they're fairly rigorous, but again, you know, if you've been following the development process properly, it shouldn't be too big a deal and, and you should be designing the product to deal with all that. I think you've, you've also got that other part as well now where, you know, it's certified training um, for installation. Um, right. I mean, in the old days, networks were, were fairly simple, but I know things like the, Profibus group, you know, they do certified training. I know HMS, we offer sort of certified training, but now we're moving into, as you said, more Ethernet based networks. Actually, this is probably where you need to have even better installers because you can keep plugging routers and switches and having them in all different combinations and adding wireless connections. And then you end up with bandwidth problems and uh, data throughput and throttling errors. So this kind of need to have certified training of, of to install the networks correctly i think it's becoming uh, a really popular uh, issue i certainly know from hms it's something we are very keen to uh, to help our customers and deliver those type of training courses because right. yeah yeah the technology set is certainly in the uk you know we we tend to be more electromechanical engineering doing automation rather than i you know it people mm -hmm. but as you said ethernet is becoming much more complicated uh and the and the opportunities are great but you do need to have more of an it uh skill set um certainly to diagnose issues on on ethernet based networks yeah well i, I guess you know that this is coming back to the double-edged sword thing again um you know it, it's offering you a lot more flexibility but then to kind of take advantage of that those benefits yeah maybe there's a there's a bit of extra knowledge that you need to have to to fully exploit it so it's true but you know 
that's the way technology is you know technology is always moving forward and new features and benefits arrive and you know you need to know how to use them properly otherwise we'd probably all still be sitting in caves um cooking over log fires or something so you know it's just part of the way things are i guess and nothing in the fridge yes um right. so um what um what do you see as the i mean just trying to formulate this um you're painting a picture where large companies are perhaps on top of this but a lot of manufacturing companies of smaller size and smes um there are they more susceptible to not having the in-house knowledge and perhaps getting involved with um products that aren't properly conformance tested is that is that a risk area um well yeah you, you're right obviously if you're a large company you have more resources to throw at things and so on um i i think you know one one of the one of the things that's happened is there's obviously there's been a lot of talk over the past few years in the media about industry 4.0 and the I iot and all this kind of stuff and ethernet everywhere and yeah i i think maybe some people have kind of gotten misled into the into the point of view that we kind of have to like rip everything out and put switches everywhere and there's cabling all over the place and wi-fi and you know it's going to be this massive you know undertaking it, it doesn't have to be like that you know as, as we were saying earlier um in manufacturing the actual pace of change in technology tends to be a lot slower than perhaps in some other industries so what what you typically see is that you know even for the larger companies you know they, they don't necessarily want to be spending money if they don't have to um so the idea is that okay we'll, we'll we'll find some pain point right now where perhaps we can apply some of this technology to help improve it so we'll kind of address that part of the factory or that machine or something first and see how we can improve things and then you know we can kind of if that works out well then we can take that and we can take what we've learned and we can apply that to somewhere else in the factory maybe and we can do it step by step you know it, it's a very sort of scalable approach if you like you, you you don't have to go into the factory and throw everything out and spend hundreds of millions of pounds and start from scratch you know it, it, you can kind of do it step by step as as your resources allow but you've also got this now where you know when you are using networks in you know, using the the sort of technologies where if you're a machine manufacturer um if an end user is having problems it doesn't matter whether it's a small company or a large company they can now ask the machine manufacturer to dial into their device on a network and then get access and do the diagnostics and stuff like that. And I think this is something which kind of, as John said, you know, you've got different layers on things like Ethernet. So on these Ethernet networks, you can actually couple that type of remote accessing capability, uh, which you can never really do on something like an RS-485 network. So, you know, as companies how can I call it, don't have their own maintenance uh, department anymore. Obviously, people are trying to shrink down their, uh, you know, their overhead costs. Um, so maintenance departments tend to be more fragmented. But then you can use the actual suppliers of the devices. Now, that, as I said, could be a machine. It could be even the device. You know, there's no reason why, uh, and, you know, a frequency inverter manufacturer can't dial up onto a network, get access to their a inverter and help the a local end user directly i mean whether they charge to pay or, or charge and that is another another question but uh, yeah. but then yeah. you've got the cyber security question is that something which the it departments would allow but the technology is definitely there certainly with the you know the later um you know uh ethernet based uh networks yeah but you also uh, have the ability to upgrade the software and presumably do security upgrades remotely as well don't you yeah you do i mean that's oh sorry john no i was just going to say i i think the other key point here too is is that you know all the different vendors in the industry are sympathetic to these this as well because you know i i think they all realize that if they put this product out on the market but it's like a nightmare to configure and set up and and get running then nobody's going to buy it so um so you know I, I think a lot of the device vendors themselves are realizing you know we have to make this as easy as possible for everybody if we're going to uh, maximize our sales so you know I, I think you very often see that okay so maybe there's some kind of complicated ethernet or whatever going on under the hood as it were but then kind of 
on the surface from the user's point of view, it, they've kind of made it as straightforward as they can so that um, people can get it, get it up and running quickly. Yeah, I think also you've got, you know, you, you mentioned about firmware, uh, Andy, that, that's quite important because the more complicated products become, you know, they're using much more complicated processor. They've got a lot more going on inside. You know, even small IO blocks have quite complex processors now. Um, you know, to try and, um, as I said, update those things, you know, if it's sending an engineer to site, it's a very expensive hobby. Um, and yeah, look how many times you have to update things on your mobile phone. Now, I know it's a little bit more complicated than a, a frequency inverter, but, you know, there is that issue. And also, don't forget, Ethernet networks, and in fact, actually networks per se, they're all actually improving their technologies. Look how many different releases they have because they're adding new features or adding new, um, you know, uh, uh, things that people want to make their life easier. You know, they're adding new profiles. So how do you keep your devices on the network up to date? You know, you can either send an engineer and they plug into the device directly or you do it through your network. Um, but again, as you said, you've then got the cybersecurity issue. You know, how do you make connecting a device on a network uh, secure? I mean, you know, two-way authentication, uh, you know, birth certificates, all these things they're there but are people able to manage it because i think the biggest problem is you've got to have your own um sort of in-house maintenance of your systems you know from a security thing passwords you know how many default passwords do you see on devices john it must be you know people just don't change their password they can use the manufacturer's yeah. what was it one two three abc or even D. worse there's a label stuck on it that says password is admin <laughs> 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 but unfortunately that that's the thing i know industry's been forced to change so nowadays when you're you're talking of a like an iot product you have to give it a one-time password so you know like you know we make gateways which are um our iot gateways so when we supply these things um you can only use the password once you are physically forced to change the password before you can actually use the device um but that's because the industry isn't looking after the cybersecurity aspect of, of business themselves. IT departments, they're, they're supposed to be really good at this, even though sometimes, you know, you see companies who've got email addresses of people who left years ago, you know, but that's their own housekeeping. But more and more, when we're looking at these more complicated networks, it comes down to the automation engineers to be the custodians and actually have it's kind of discipline of removing passwords. So if anybody leaves the company to remove their access, if you've got good housekeeping for cybersecurity, you know, that would solve a lot of the problems because that's one of the biggest areas. You know, it's it's just people not um, changing their passwords properly. When someone leaves, removing that access from a network, you know, these are the things which, you know, can cause problems because let's be honest, most cybersecurity issues are, are, are created by, you know, disgruntled employees. You know, it's not some 13 year old boy in his, you know, bedroom at midnight hacking into your PLC. It's usually somebody who's upset with a company and they just want to, you know, inflict a little bit of pain because they feel, you know, um, sort of a sour taste in their mouth. So you, these you are made the a point a little bit earlier, John, about, um, and you've just reinforced it actually, David, about, about, the responsibility falling to automation engineers and people with electromechanical backgrounds. There doesn't seem to be a transfer of expertise from the, you know, the IT sector looking after perhaps the business requirements of a of a of an organization into the manufacturing sector. But what's stopping that from happening? Um well actually I think in, well in in probably the more enlightened companies, you might say, um, I think there there is that starting to happen. I mean, I, I know I, I've talked to some end users where um, okay, they were big multinational corporations, but um, they they have they have realised that yeah, okay, so there's this blurring of the IT world and the OT world, as they call it, operational technology, the shop floor, and um, and as a result, um, you're now starting to see in some companies that yeah, the IT the IT function, as it were, in the company, isn't just for like the laptops on the desks in the office. You know, it's it's down on the shop floor as well, taking care of whatever it is that's down there that they need to look after. Um, in in fact, I I remember a story from one of these companies where um, before this kind of thing happened, they actually didn't like having the IT guys come around and and telling them what to do and. Um, and apparently the way they used to deal with that was um, 
when the IT guy asked where the PLC was on the shop floor, they just point to the big cabinet that said "Danger 600 volts" on it, <laughs> and um, and then they'd leave them alone. But uh, but those those days are past. You know, we're we're past that now, and everybody's working together to to reap the benefits we've been talking about. And as a result, I, I think you know. An IT guy isn't necessarily a guy sitting behind a desk in an office. He could be down on the shop floor with a boiler suit and a hard hat on and, and doing stuff down there too. We are, we're seeing a lot more people from a, what we call an IT background getting involved in decision yeah. makings about networks. Um, as you said, there used to be this OTIT you know, gap, you know, which the edges, you know, they keep calling it nowadays. But I think there's this, this big merging, this overlapping um of technologies and uh, maybe it's because people are more au fait with that type of it technology because of the home computing you know they yeah. use bt home hubs you know you you have to you know connect your smart tv so maybe people are becoming more aware and you know and aware of the issues yeah and, and also, well that, and as time goes on of course you've got a younger generation of people coming into the industry and um you know in in, in the past when you learned to program a plc it was all ladder logic and you know back in the day that was fine and even today you know there's still a lot of ladder logic being written but having said that you know you, you get guys coming out of university today or whatever and and they say okay well can i program this thing in python or whatever and um and, you know the manufacturers are trying to embrace that you, you you see a lot of systems now that you can program it in c or or whatever it is and um as a result you know that's that's moving things along into the future as well I think I think it's definitely changing. I, I know that I used to go to a security show at Excel periodically, um, and we were talking in the green room about my colleague John Newell, and when he couldn't get over from Kazakhstan, it fell upon me to go to the show and take a deep breath and try and convince myself that I knew enough about IT security to have sensible conversation. But what I tended to find was that a lot of little companies there with great specialisms in IT security, but we're only interested in the business side of of the activity, partly because, you know, banks are very lucrative markets and they didn't really understand, you know, it was what is a shop floor, you know, and, and complete confusion about talking about the cybersecurity risks on the shop floor. But over the years, I saw that change. Um, and these same companies were then forming partnerships with people who were supplying um, in for, uh, uh, materials and components for manufacturing um, and really understanding the importance of, of the shop floor as well. So I think that kind of bears out what uh, what you've said about a, a definite sea change in, um, in uh, IT practices becoming more accepted and um, commonplace on, on the shop floor. Right. You've seen that big kind of change where in the old days in the office, you know, people would send a message on their own office network. Nobody cared if it was sent two or three times. Um, whereas if you look at an industry, you know, you you we've always had these kind of deterministic networks, which always tend to be the top end stuff. But, you know, because we can't send the message two or three times, it has to be, you know, the first time, especially when we're looking at safety networks. And as I said, this what John mentioned earlier about TSNs, you know, this is why we're moving over to TSNs, because we need to have that deterministic down into a more granular level. Um, we don't need to have it just on the top end uh, networks. We need it also on the lower end networks. Um, whereas the IT people who are not doing an office network, you know, if they're sending that email two or three times and it's, you know, rejected, it doesn't matter. It will just happen on the fourth and they're OK with that. Unfortunately, we, we don't have that in industry. We're actually a little bit more, um, how can you call it, aware of those issues. Um, and this is why TSN networks are becoming very uh, important because we can't send a message two or three times, certainly not on a safety network. Yep. Let, let's yeah, talk a little bit about TSNs, John, because that was one of the, um, the areas that we said we would cover. Um, so talk a little bit about the evolution of TSN and what it has to offer um, right. going forward. And then after that, I want to talk about, um, you know, 5G and sundowning. And, and uh, I, I guess we could probably carry on talking for five days, but uh, we've already spoken for 50 minutes. So let's let's focus on those two issues. And, um, sure. and yeah. 
Well, I can give a very brief overview of TSM. I mean, like you say, I mean, I could probably talk all day about TSM, but I know nobody wants to hear that, so that's fine. Um, but, but basically, T TSM, as we said at the beginning, uh, just to recap, um, it stands for Time Sensitive Networking. And um, originally, where it came from uh, was nothing industrial at all. Um, if you go back into the history of it, it was actually, it came out of the professional broadcast and, and, and media industries. And um, it was originally developed for a more effective way for dealing with like broadcast signals in TV studios and all that kind of stuff. And it, not nothing to do with industry really at all. And um, and so it, it was defined by a set of standards that were created by the IEEE and, and that's under the generic name of 802.1, which is kind of like the group of standards that defines it and how it works. And um, if you're ever um, really bored or need to get to sleep at night, you can go on Wikipedia and you can see there's an extensive uh, coverage of all these different standards and what they do and what they mean and how they work and all that kind of stuff. Um, but from the point of view of industrial automation at the moment, um, there's there's really only two of those that are really relevant to what we're doing in in industrial Ethernet at the moment. Um, I think there's maybe about thirty now altogether, but as I say, most of them aren't really relevant. Um, so so the two that that we have implemented at, at, at the CLPA, um, there's there's something called eight hundred two point one AS and another one called eight hundred two point one QBV. And, and it turns out, as far as I know, those letters don't actually stand for anything. They're, they're just kind of designation letters, I suppose. But, um, but those two taken together kind of provide the solution for time-sensitive networking for industrial automation. So, um, so basically, AS, um, what that is for is to provide like a common time base across the network. It, it, it provides a way of synchronizing all the devices on the network together. So they all know what time it is. And you may think, well, why is that important? Um, well, the reason why it's important is you can kind of use the analogy of, a, of running a railway network. Um, you know, the, the trains all have to make sure they get from one place to another place for a given, at a given time. So, you know, you expect that the train's going to arrive at the next station at whatever time that's going to be. And, and as a result, you can run a network and everybody knows where the trains are, and when they're going to get there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's all possible because everybody who's driving the trains and at the stations and everything else all know what time it is and they all know it's the same time everywhere and as a result everything works properly. Well TSN is exactly the same really except instead of it being trains that are going around uh, between stations it, it's packets of data which are moving from different nodes on the network uh, different devices. So, so that, that's why that one's important because it, it provides a way to make sure that everything's going to get there when it's supposed to. So that, that, that's actually really the foundation for the deterministic performance that we've talked about already, that you know, you, you know exactly when something's going to arrive somewhere, so therefore you know the performance of it is going to be predictable. Um, and then the, the, other, the other standard, the QBV, um, what that does, um, that, that's kind of like the, the other missing piece of the puzzle. So that's that performance it's it's um I, I believe the the official technical term for it is a time aware shaper um which what that means in layman's terms is that it, it provides the mechanism for cues of data and some of them have more priority than others so um so you can basically take all the different kinds of traffic that you want to have go across the network and you can say okay well this is more important than that and so on and you know, as as David was mentioning earlier, like for example, safety communication. Um, if if you know you've got a machine and something gets caught in it or whatever, and somebody hits the big E stop button, you want to make sure that that's going to stop or or behave as you need it to um, immediately. And so you know, safety would have a very high priority on the network traffic. But then maybe there's other things which perhaps you've got a camera in looking at something on the machine and it sends video frames across the network and um, you know if it's providing you an update maybe once a second or something then maybe that's fine so as a result that's a that's a lower priority on the network so so basically by using the QBV standard it, it allows you to use the same network for many different functions so um, 
So the idea is, you know, in the past where maybe you had one network for safety, one network for motion control, another one maybe for your, for your cameras and something else for your IO and so on. That, that was all, you know, fairly complicated and expensive to uh, design and, and produce. Um, but now with TSN, the, the possibility exists that you can now just put all this together on one network, even safety, and, um, and it all works together. And, um, you know, your, net, your machines are simpler, they're less expensive, you can develop them faster, quicker time to market and, and all these kind of things. So, so you know, it, it's offering um, a lot of positive benefits for as we move forwards. That's a great explanation. So, so I guess your QBV would be like the equivalent of the railway signals, if you like. And uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, to carry the analogy the, on. Uh, yeah, I suppose you're right. It probably would train. be, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of time, I mean, how accurate does the time need to be and how much of a factor is that? I mean, are we talking cesium clock accuracy or something slightly less? Um, well, yeah, if, if you if you dig deep, even deeper into it, um, there's another standard called IEEE 1588, um, and, and that kind of defines all that kind of stuff. I mean, but basically, basically the, the way the way it works, I mean, again, again I don't think we get, get really deep into this here, but... Um, there's you have what are called grandmaster clocks and and they are basically the sort of time reference for the network so that they they say okay well now it's 1058 and 23 seconds or whatever and everybody knows that and 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 really the the, the way the determinism is guaranteed is that not only is it synchronized across the network but you know if i'm going from this point to that point it's going to take this amount of time so therefore you know to make sure that everything is moving around at the same rate, you have to plan for those delays to make sure that um, in, you're not expecting something to get there before it will do. Uh, I mean, you know, in the, the technical term for that is latency. Um, so basically the, the delay that it takes for a packet of data to get from one place to another. And then actually just to kind of finish that point, um, there's, um, there's something else which goes along with latency called jitter. And uh, jitter is basically the variability in the latency. So, you know, maybe sometimes it takes 11 milliseconds, sometimes it takes nine milliseconds. And, and so, you, you know, by using TSN, you can keep all that under control as well. Mm. Excellent. OK, uh, let's talk about the development then of, um, of, of, of um, networks in terms of 5G, 6G and where we are with 2G and 3G and, and all of that, David. Yeah, well, that's a that's a really good topic, isn't it? Um, yeah, the problem we have is the um, the existing sort of infrastructures we have, 2G, 3G, um, they're becoming particularly old. Uh, they don't have very much bandwidth. Um, manufacturers are struggling to find the components uh, to keep these networks running. A lot of the phone companies are not seeing a um, great deal of profit from them. So there is a kind of interest uh, by the government to try and keep certain networks alive a little bit longer. So things like 2G, uh, because the uh, the motorway infrastructures are based on the old uh, um, 2G technologies. But really, it comes down to, you know, the technology is, is very hard to sustain. Um, so what's happening now, we've also got, you know, the big increase of things like 5G. Um, so 5G was probably what 4G was supposed to be. Um, 3G had a lot of really good technologies, um, especially if you've got mobile applications. So you can switch between base stations very easily. Unfortunately, that was never passed on to 4G uh, properly. So 5G is kind of giving the, let's call it the technology, the, um, the flexibility of the 3G, but with huge bandwidth um, compared to 4G or uh, 3G. So there is this big move. Obviously, we're all doing it with our mobile phones. I don't know anyone who doesn't have a 5G phone now. Um, the problem is, obviously, um, there are certain problems with 5G um, because you've got a much greater sort of transmission of data. You actually can transmit shorter distances. You can't have huge distances, whereas in the old 2G networks, you could probably have 30 miles. You could be in the middle of the Serengeti and get a signal on your phone. Uh, with 5G, it doesn't work that way um, because obviously the, the high frequencies and the bandwidths, you know, you'll probably be microwaving people, which isn't a good thing. So there is this move over. Uh, you've got obviously two parts of the discussion. You've got using the 
you know, the networks which are available from Vodafone and uh, E and all those type of people. Uh, but from an industrial point of view, it's actually moving over to using things like 5G within an industrial environment. Now, when 5G first came out, a typical network, if you wanted to have your own 5G network, you'd probably be paying about a million pounds. So it was kind of above what people would be prepared to pay. But now if you speak to people like Ericsson, um, you can have your own 5G network in your building, in your factory, in your warehouse, um, and you're probably looking at about £100,000. Uh, and then you're making your own SIMs at, say, a pound a pop. So actually, the, the cost of going to your own 5G network as a company is actually uh, quite feasible. And of course, you've got lots of benefits because... If we're looking at conventional Wi-Fi and VLAN, especially when we're looking at an industrial environment, there's a lot of metal work. The, these networks don't actually do very well in certain um, environments, you know, like a warehouse. Um, you've got a lot of metal racking. Wi-Fi doesn't work so well, um, or VLAN, shall I say. So you've got the choice. You can either go to industrial Bluetooth, which is a great technology if you've got a lot of metal work. So it's a Wi-Fi technology. Um, or you can go to networks like 5G, which again works very well with, uh, with a lot of metal work. Um, and the reason these are important is there are always um, sort of connected devices on the network that need to have some sort of fast data transmission. Let's say a storage retrieval machine going up and down a, you know, um, a, a warehouse rail or an AGV going around a uh, production line. You know, these things need a lot of data. They need also a fast connection because, as John said, safety is very important. You know, if you want to stop an AGV because it's heading towards um, somebody, you know, it, it needs a very fast reacting network to turn off the device. Uh, and turning off the power actually on something that weighs four or five tons probably isn't um, the most uh, productive thing to do. What you need to have is to have a controlled shutdown uh, certainly with something like a storage retrieval crane, you know, these things weigh probably 40 tons. Uh, and if you just turn the power off and hope it's going to stop, um, that's not really going to help a situation if it's heading towards somebody laying on a track. So these things about using um, wireless networks, A, you can replace your, um, you know, your conventional cables using uh, wireless devices. Things like 5G um, will replace those. So you can actually have like a wireless bridge. So you're breaking your, let's say your C-Link cable or your C-Link IA cable, doesn't matter, but you've still got that high speed communication between the nodes. You know, previously when you were looking at ethernet networks, these wireless bridges weren't able to do real time communication between the heads because the bandwidth and the speed wasn't there. So you'd have to buffer your network. Um, now you can do that directly without having to, uh, to worry about buffering, you know, they're so fast. And this is why they are becoming um, much more prevalent and, you know, and used in the um, in the automation. You know, they can replace slip rings, slip rings. If they get dirt in them, they just interrupt the data. So when, as John was saying, you know, people want to have time sensitive networks because they want the data, they want it in a deterministic manner. Then, you know, to remove these things which actually can mechanically uh, deteriorate is a really uh, positive thing to do. And, and to say, you know, and this is why, um, you know, wireless networks, 5G is becoming important, you know, and the price is coming down. Um, but also because, you know, mobile phone companies are going to start switching off 2G, 3G anyway. The government's legislated, I think it's 2028, they're going to shut down the 3G network completely, but most companies will have shut it down beforehand. But as I said, that's more yep. your, your mobile phone, not your industrial uh, mm. 5G. So there'll be a lot of legacy um, machines that will need to be upgraded to. There to will be a lot a of 5G yeah, network. So. Remote access devices, RTUs, which all a lot of them are using 3G, 2G. But you know, it's it's not all doom and gloom because there are a lot of companies who do. You know, we do a thing called a bolt, which is like a you know like a 5G bolt. It's like I suppose about the size of a, of a small cup. You put it on your system, connect it into uh, a host device. All of a sudden, you've got a 5G connection. Now, whether that's uh, to a Vodafone network or to a private 5G, doesn't make any difference. You just put the 5G SIM card in it. So there is a lot of ways of connecting these old networks. But the problem is people need to be aware that their provider, if they've got SIM cards from, say, Vodafone, 
uh, in their uh, 2G, 3G device and Vodafone are turning off these networks, then you know they need to do some sort of upgrade path now um, because most of the devices that use mobile phone networks tend to be remote. They're not all in one cluster in a building. You know That's where you tend to have um, you know, proper industrial networks. But these are things that are on pumping stations or on, you know, uh, outlining sewage plants or monitoring, uh, you know, power boxes across the, the national grid, you know, backup generators. So people need to be aware that the network operators are shutting down. The government has already legislated that they want these networks shut down by a certain date anyway, um, because they want to use that bandwidth to uh, increase things like 60, as you said. You know, there is only a certain spectrum of frequencies which we can use. And so what the government wants to do is to clear away the old uh, networks so they've got some more frequencies which they can allocate either for private networks yes. or for newer networks. Um, and this is why they want to do it. But before the government actually terminates it in any country, it will be the phone operators will close down those networks more um because there's no commercial advantage uh at the moment uh for them to keep them running maybe one company might see there's an opportunity and you know since everyone else is closing down they'll just keep their 2g network running but there will be a point where the government will then say look it's got to go because we need that bandwidth and you know and people are talking about 60 already even though it's not really uh you know a, a really a good discussion point at the moment but you know there are plans for it but you're talking probably 10 10 years time before it even comes into the phone industry let alone industry do you, do you see any um coordination between governments so as, as to when 2g and 3d networks are likely to be shut down you know Nobody i mean is, is the uk out on its own is europe different yeah. is the us different uh, do you know uh, what third they world countries and so yeah. on? They they do tend to certain countries. Obviously, if you're looking at countries like the UAE and stuff like that, they've got so much money. They're already moving over to the five G infrastructure because they're starting from afresh. You know, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they're building brand new cities. So of course mm -hmm. they're using. You know, they haven't even got two G or three G. They're all starting to go straight with five G. But there is. You know, the, the common factor is people like Vodafone, they're a global supplier. So, you know, whether they've got their own uh, brand they're using or someone else, you know, a sub brand, you know, they will determine, OK, there's just no money in it. You know, the mobile phone operators, they want people to use their mobile phone more. They want them to stream more. They want them to download more because that's where they make their money. You know, they don't make their money from uh, text messages now. It's all about streaming and people paying for, for the data uh, connectivity. And you can't really stream movies on 2G, 3G, it's it's extremely slow. So they have a, let's call it a vested interest that people want these, um, you know, to, to have these streaming services. Therefore, you need to have a network which can support it. So they want people to move over. The government, obviously, they want to free up the frequencies so they can invest in other network uh, or sell private because, as I said, you can buy your own private 5G uh, frequency. Um, and a lot of companies are, are going that way. You know, people like, you know, the, the big warehousing companies like the Amazons and stuff, you know, Tesco's and stuff. They must be looking at that because they want the advantages of 5G in their warehouse to control all their devices rather than be using a VLAN or something which has uh, certain, how can we call it, um, Fresnel's own image, you know, uh, problems. Um, you know, we, we were at a, um a, an exhibition called the interlogistic show and we we're talking about you know the fresnel zones and stuff like this and there are so many companies they accept that they've got blind spots in their buildings you know for their agvs or for their staff and their pick and place things and yet they just accept it but now you know they're realizing if they go over to things like 5g have their own network um and again you know it's it's not just for connecting to agvs it's for connecting plc to plc drives they can they can do anything with it it's just a wireless communication between two different nodes or multiple nodes but they're seeing that there is uh, a big advantage and they've got much more coverage of their of their factory or their building than with conventional uh, vlan yeah i mean it's it's an absolutely fascinating area i mean if um if it still costs 100k you know which is much better than a million um is that going to give a greater advantage to larger organizations and hold up the progression of smaller ones or how would that be dealt with 
Well, when you think about 100k isn't actually that much. You think about how much companies spend on their IT infrastructure. You know, I know companies like HMS, you know, we probably spend 10 times that per year on our infrastructure, um, on our IT infrastructure. So it's actually not that big a commitment. Plus, don't forget, you're actually be using a lot less um, access points. So if you if you want to have access points for your factory using something like uh, 4G or 3G, you need an awful lot of access points. Whereas 5G, you're probably using a third uh, less access points. So your cost of maintaining your warehouse, because access points break like everything else, they get hit by cranes, they get you know pooed on by pigeons. These things don't need to be um, you know, replace so easily. Plus, as I said, you need uh, fewer of them because their uh, their bandwidth is so much greater. So there's a lot of, you know, the initial upfront cost is is more. You know, but again, it, it's not surmountable when you're you're looking at a an average manufacturing company. Um, if they want to connect their robots or their PLCs and stuff, it's actually not much. That's probably the MB's you know price of his new BMW, and that's it. And is there any likelihood that you've got your private 5G network? How how does that talk to your external publicly available 5G network? Or doesn't it? It doesn't. To? There's no connection at all. So basically, you're on a completely separate frequency, which is reserved for you. So the SIM cards, you make your own SIM cards, and they only talk on your frequency. So all your robots, all your PLCs and stuff like that. Point it, it, it is, because, you know, I mean... If you can always get onto a different frequency, you can buy frequency scanners. You know, it's it's only as secure as you want to be. You know, you just need to have that strength and depth. But the the Wi-Fi, because it 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 doesn't sit within a building. If you want a, a, a totally secure network, then you go with you know fiber optic cable, very hard to hack into because you need to physically connect. But if you are um, you know, I suppose using Wi-Fi networks, then technically someone can sit in the on a road outside the building and log in. But it's mm. actually very hard to hack because they don't need to just hack into the network. They've then got to hack into, say, the, the CC Link, you know, uh, TSN network as well. So they need to be an expert in TSN. But then when they're on the network, then they've got to be able to get to the device. Then they've got to be an expert on the device. So it's that. Is it really going to be a problem? Are people literally going to do that for, for what advantage? Um, you know, you know, to sort of delay Capri's making, you know, Easter eggs? Probably not. Maybe if it's a nuclear power station, I can see that. But then they have legislation in, you know, that they don't have access to critical components with any kind of a connection to the outside world. So they would just use a closed network on their product, you know, and everything would be cabled. So it, it's always the balance, uh, Andy, between, you know, this kind of strength in depth cybersecurity approach and, and you know, and, and common sense. Um and uh, if you don't use them, then you're just losing out on a lot of things. But you know, most people use Wi-Fi and you know these things at home, and they don't care about people hacking into their networks and uh, connect onto their computers and look at their bank details. Well, it's probably more likely your neighbour's going to do it than somebody sitting outside a you know a Walker's Chris. It's always amused me about how um, how free we are with our credit cards, and yet we're so protective about our industrial data. But um... Well, this, well, the whole internet is based on trust, isn't it? You know, there yeah. is no, you know, even you say you've got your, um, you know, your trustworthy, uh, what they call it, locked network. Well, that's actually because only somebody has vouched and said, you know what, this company is very secure. You know, look how many sort of rushing, Russian websites are, uh, <laughs> are secure according to the internet. So, you know, it's it's very subjective, but you have to have a common sense approach to these things. You know, if somebody really, really, really wants to get into your industrial network, you know, if they really want to get onto CC link and they really want to get onto that frequency inverter to do some damage, it's probably not going to be someone sitting on a, you know, in a bedroom at night doing that. It's going to be some sort of international um, government player. And to be honest, you know, they're not really that interested in interrupting, you know, uh, you know, Mrs. Miggins pie factory production rates. So, but yeah, as I said, it's, you know, you can use the technology, but just use it right. Housekeeping is the biggest problem. If you want to use any of these sort of IoT project yeah, products or technologies, you know, like networks or the wireless networks, just use good housekeeping. Um, yeah. You know, make sure that, you know, you're restricting the access. You know, when people leave, change the passwords, remove them from your databases. 
then your network technology is secure. You know, it's a bit like, you know, PLCs. You know, if you've got a PLC password, everyone knows, well, then change it every so many months just so that, you know, the people who leave can't get access. Um, you know, but as I say, we have to put it in perspective. Most people do not uh, want to hack into a, a factory or a warehouse or anything like that. That's not really what they're after. They're after people's Bitcoins and, you know, uh, you yeah. know big money hits. Um, you know, they really don't want to log into Walkers to get the, the you know, the, the details of their Walkers Chris special spicy flavor ingredients. You know, that's that's not really uh, what it's all about. But, you know, we just need to be sensible. Excellent. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed the discussion about TSN and um, and 5G, and I think that will be very useful to everyone who's logged on and those who haven't, who will receive it on demand and will then chop it all up into podcasts as well and write some articles into our magazines at DFA Media Group as well. Um, I'd like to leave you with one question, um, which you can both answer, which is, where do you see this in 10 years time john well of course one of the topics we haven't talked about at all which would fill another day um is is ai and machine learning and um you know i i think two or three years ago nobody was really talking about that kind of stuff in manufacturing but now it's like everything else over the past year or two it, it's it's again that's arrived in manufacturing too so um I, I suspect ten years from now we'll we'll see um, factories that are, you know, there's going to be a lot more use of AI to optimize processes and make sure things are working in the best way. And, and but you know, we're fine with that at the CRPA because, um, you know, the AI is going to need data to do its job, mm. and you've got to get the data out of the process and into the AI so it can figure out what's going on, and and you know that's where we come in we're basically providing the plumbing if you like to um to make that all work so um it's kind of down to us to make sure that we keep offering the technologies that are necessary to do that in the best way so you know today it's tsn and gigabit ethernet 10 years from now maybe it's 8g or something which apparently is is being talked about so um yeah it, it's that, i think that's where we're headed for as far as we can see at the moment all right <clears throat> And David, what do you see as being the? I, I think basically it's it's kind of when we're talking of industry, we're a very conservative area. I mean, it's this kind of slow progress. We tend to have evolution rather than revolution. Um, you are going to have people wanting more from their networks. They want to have more data. Hopefully, they'll understand what they can do with it uh, a little bit better. But that's also industry's obligation. You know, there we need to basically educate our customers what they can do and how they can do it. Um, and I think also there'll be a little bit more legislation because, you know, we've already had to change legislation because of one-time passwords. I think you're going to see more of that coming in to help people um, have more secure networks, secure systems. That's going to come on. As John mentioned, AI, big topic. Uh, you know, we're already working with AI um, with a few of our products and, you know, that will become a norm. But again, legislation will probably uh, come into place. You know, we've got things like the, uh, you know, data centers and data security acts coming in. I think that's also going to be becoming more prevalent um, as people need to kind of legislate to protect us from ourselves sometimes. Lovely. Well, let's leave it there. And thank you very much for your time, David and John, and everyone who's listened in. Mm -hmm.